Yeah, I think it's more quality where your protein's coming from more so than quantity. And I think lack of cycling protein. So you want mm. phases of where you're working out and basically breaking down your protein and intermittent fasting where you're not consuming a lot and then feasting. So it's more so people aren't going through the cyclical protein intake that we used to do that our genes are matched to. Chronically eating a high amount of you know animal protein, um, not necessarily a good thing. You need to cycle that. I'm actually doing the research on the substance. I've published several clinical papers and I've done an entire review and I've looked at all the studies and simply from an evolutionary aspect as well, I'm pretty confident that it, that it will contribute to mm. my longevity. Do you want to know what it is body mind empowerment get stronger faster smarter quicker friendlier more helpful more driven everything the body needs control your mind welcome to the body mind empowerment podcast i'm a host seamland and our guest today is james de nicol antonio james is a cardiovascular research scientist and the associate editor of british medical journals open heart He's also the author of The Salt Fix, Superfuel, and The Longevity Solution. James, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and uh, I've been really being fascinated by your <laughs> recent books, and they've been also really good, especially like The Salt Fix and uh, Superfuel. But uh, how did you get involved with, uh, you know, into this research of cardiovascular health and general medicine? Yeah, so I mean, it started when I was a community pharmacist. Um, Basically, I was having a ton of patients coming up to me, put on blood pressure medications, and now they all of a sudden weren't feeling well. Um, and they were also told to like cut down on their salt intake, right? Because I mean, I mean, since ever since the 1960s, every single medical doctor has been trained that if someone has high blood pressure in your medical office, you recommend a low salt diet. That's like first line, you know, dietary advice. Um, but my patients weren't responding well to that, mm -hmm. and so when I would kind of push back and say, well, maybe, you know, get your sodium levels tested, you know? Um, and a lot of times they would come back low. Um, patients were feeling dizzy on low salt diets. And, you know, when the doctors would either tell them to increase their salt intake or they would lower their blood pressure dose, they felt amazingly better. Mm -hmm. So I, know, I knew the power of maintaining an adequate salt status, not only for my patients, but being a wrestler and I ran cross country um, in, in high school, I knew the importance of salt and exercise. So if exercise is supposed to be one of the best things for us and salt helps people exercise better, longer, then why would, why would there be a blanket recommendation for low salt for everybody? So when I actually looked at the, the research, there's not a single clinical study that actually has given the same diets to patients with the only difference being the level of salt intake. They always give them like more fruits and vegetables. They cut out processed meat. It just happens to be lower in salt, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, honestly have no idea how these meta-analyses, including those type of studies, can actually conclude that low salt is dr the driver of the benefit. Um, mm -hmm. But they do, which makes absolutely no sense because, again, they're changing the entire diet. And when you look at these longevity populations like you know Japan, South Korea, these people are living the longest and living the healthiest lives. They eat a ton of salt. So like, mm -hmm. you know, they're eating kombu. If you, if you don't know what kombu is, it's basically a salty seaweed. It contains almost 1,000 milligrams of sodium per ounce. Um, and the average South Korean and the average person living in Japan is consuming, you know, anywhere from five to six grams of sodium. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you even look at it at a population level, there's never been any evidence to stand for. So that's really what got me into writing the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite interesting, yeah, that... Uh, the salt has been villainized, but it, it's like essential thing for life. And even animals go out of their own way to seek salt in nature. And uh, in the past, I will also believe, I think I read it in your book that uh, in uh, medieval times or in uh, Roman times, the people were also paid by salt. So it's really like, yeah. even for people, quite a, quite an important thing. Uh, but but yeah. how, how does the kind of correlation was... Uh, created initially that salt is going to cause like a heart disease or something? Yeah, so there was a, just like with, you know, the demonization of saturated fat and animal fat with Ansel Keys, we had a similar type of story with salt. Um, we had someone named Louis Dahl, who he created genetically modified, he inbred mice and rats to be sensitive to salt. And when he wow. gave those sensitive rats in the equivalent of, you know, 100 grams of salt for a human, so like 10 times the normal salt intake, 
yeah, they developed hypertension and strokes and things like that. But when he tried to give even a high dose, three or four times the amount of a normal salt intake for a human to normal rats, it did absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that was extrapolated from not only his genetically modified salt sensitive rats, but also from basically cherry pick studies. So he would look at, he looked at six populations. He published uh, a paper back in the 1960. And very similar to the Ansel Key story where, where Ansel Keys drew kind of like a linear line as animal fat increased, so did the risk of heart disease. Um, Lewis Dahl did the same thing. He plotted six populations and showed that as salt intake increased, the prevalence of hypertension increased. But then 20 years later, you had, you know, InterSalt and other studies come out that looked at about 50 different studies. And you actually saw that as salt intake increased, blood pressure slightly went down. And a lot of people don't realize like salt can literally treat hypertension in certain cases because when you restrict salt, your artery stiffening hormones go up. So aldosterone, renin, angiotensin II, the exact things that we block with medication to lower blood pressure, lower stroke and heart attack mm -hmm. is what gets elevated when you cut out salt. So, you know, it was based on just poor evidence from decades ago. Mm. So it's like uh, if you restrict your salt, then you actually cause hypertension in a sense because yeah, of the body exactly. is going to crave <laughs> crave for it and i i i think also like insulin may play, play quite a role in the uh elevation of blood pressure that people think is associated with salt but it's simply yeah. caused by insulin and carbohydrates well yeah that's i mean one of the things that a lot of people too are, are missing on a keto diet is the salt because you know insulin levels when you cut out carbohydrate intakes insulin levels go down um, and that causes the kidneys to spill out salt. So when you're not getting enough salt, what do the kidneys want to do? They want to retain more salt. How do they do that? The, the body elevates insulin levels and makes you become more insulin resistant on a low salt diet so your body can retain more salt. And not only that, so you can absorb more salt. So the clinical studies, if you look at um, meta-analyses, looking at low sodium diets, they show that it significantly increases fasting insulin levels. And when you look at oral glucose tolerance tests in people who have been on a low salt diet, it increases the AUC of glucose and insulin just as bad as you would see with a high sugar diet. So literally low, I need people to think low salt is just as bad as a high sugar diet. Wow. That's great. Quite, quite a paradigm shift, I believe, for a lot of people. But how much, uh, how much salt should people consume them on a day? It, and this is, the, this is where we get in the nuance of not just salt, but how much protein. It's different for everybody, right? So like, mm -hmm. you know, salt intake is highly dependent on how much you're losing. So you can lose a lot through the kidneys if you're consuming caffeine. So if, you, if you're someone who drinks a lot of coffee or you drink caffeinated tea, um, you're going to need a lot more salt than someone who doesn't drink those beverages because mm -hmm. most people view coffee as a diuretic, but it actually depletes you of sodium and chloride much more. So you lose about, mm -hmm. you know, a full, um, if you were to consume about six cups of coffee, you'll lose about a full teaspoon of salt. If you consume about four cups of coffee, you lose a full half a teaspoon of salt in the urine. So mm -hmm. that's just one salt depleter. Um, I mean, low sodium levels in the body is the most common electrolyte abnormality. So certain people who have um, what's called POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, when they basically go from a seated to a standing position, they feel dizzy. Those people need a lot more salt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and if you're someone who exercises, I try to exercise twice a week. Um, the average person is going to lose about a half a teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise. And that depends mm -hmm. on how, how hot it is. And in the book, I go through how much you need depending on the ambient temperature but I mean, just typically, if you're on a ketogenic diet, you know, most people need an extra thousand to 2000 milligrams of sodium or an extra half a teaspoon of salt on top of, you know, one and a half teaspoons already. So mm -hmm. you're looking at someone who's on keto may fully benefit from two, two and a half full teaspoons of salt, depending on lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You're right, right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But uh, are the other electrolytes also important, like magnesium or potassium? Yeah, no, they are. And, and really, salt allows people to eat those bitter foods that are high in magnesium and potassium. Um, a lot of people think, you know, meat is high in potassium. But the problem is, is when you cook meat, it cooks out the potassium. Mm. Um, so just because, you know, raw meat is high in potassium, that's not exactly the potassium you're getting once you cook it and eat it. Mm. Um, so you know, I think potassium and magnesium are missing minerals, but I think even bigger than that is insulin resistance, which causes your cells to not be able to take up magnesium. So, 
-hmm. If you are insulin resistant, you need insulin to not only drive potassium into the cell, but also magnesium. And if you are hyperinsulinemic, which probably 75% of the population is, you are spilling magnesium in the urine because insulin is a magnesium waster. So mm -hmm. even more so than consuming foods, it's fixing the insulin resistance and the hyperinsulinemia that's affecting 75% of the population that's causing us to be depleted in magnesium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, how, how would you, what, what would be like the first step for someone to fix their hyperinsulinemia? Yeah, I mean, the easiest thing would be fasting, right? Mm -hmm. Intermittent fasting, um, particularly, you know, probably if you want to get into the deeper autophagy, you really want to hit 18 hours at, at a minimum, um, unless you're working out. I mean, working mm -hmm. out, nothing's going to be put you into autophagy quicker than doing like a high intensity exercise. Mm -hmm. Your muscles become insulin sensitive for 48 hours. So it's the best way to activate autophagy and to improve insulin sensitivity is literally just start lifting weights. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's as simple as that and doing some high intensity interval training. Um, of course, people that, you know, have advanced heart disease and things like that, they, they would need to obviously be followed by a doctor and go slow and all this. And there's always nuance to everything. Right. Mm -hmm. But in general exercise, which everybody knows intermittent fasting. And then there's these cool little dietary swaps that you can do. Um, that activate autophagy and improve insulin sensitivity, um, cutting out refined you know, sugars, carbs. Everybody knows that. Um, some people are starting to understand the harms of omega-6 and how omega-6 drives insulin resistance as well. If it's from refined vegetable oils, not getting enough omega-3s is important, particularly marine omega-3s. So those are some of the things that people can do to improve insulin sensitivity. Right, right. And uh, you do talk about it in your uh, newest book, The Longevity Solution, which you actually uh, co-authored uh, with Dr. Jason Fung. So uh, can you talk about like, uh, how did you end up writing a book with him and uh, what's it about? Yeah. So basically, like, I, I was confused you know, about what type of protein should I, should I be eating? How much protein should I be eating? You have like one camp that says you need to con like, continuously consume a low amount of protein because you have animal studies that show if you restrict methionine by 40%, you know, mice can live 20% longer. Mm -hmm. um, and there are longevity populations like the Okinawans that only consume 40 to maybe 50 grams of protein per day. But the problem is, is they don't really lift weights. They're about 15% smaller than the average American. Right. So you can't necessarily extrapolate those really low protein intakes with what you should be doing. So what like Dr. Fung and I try to do is, yeah, we looked at the blue zones because blue zones are the people who are living the longest. But then we also tried to apply, you know, this to Americans, people who are lifting more weights that are larger. Um, so, you know, the book was first, is there any benefit to consuming both plant and animal? Is there advantages to one or the other? Um, so, you know, I really wanted to take a look because you know, I started out being like animal protein. We consumed it for 2.6 million years, you know, and same with plant protein, but let, let's talk about red meat, for example, how could it be potentially bad for us? Like mm. I never really looked into it, right. but the thing, and I'm not saying red meat is bad. I consume about a pound and a half of meat per day. But the mm. thing is, is if you actually look at the studies, we hang meat for a couple of weeks, like, you know, a lion, they, they get their meal, they consume it very quickly. Otherwise, other hyenas and things like that, they're going to scavenge it. So they're eating fresh meat. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between hanging meat for a few weeks and then consuming it and eating fresh meat? Well, there's a big difference. The porphyrin ring around the iron molecule starts breaking down. So now you're releasing free iron, basically molecules that are oxidizing the fats, the proteins, and the phospholipids in hung meat. Yeah, mm -hmm. hung meat tastes amazing, mm -hmm. but it's much more oxidized than mm -hmm. fresh meat. So there are things that I think that we can do to combine with red meat to kind of counteract some of the harms. So luckily red meat has carnosine, which is one of the most potent antioxidants because it can bind free iron and free copper ions. Um, but I don't think it gets you there a hundred percent. So mm -hmm. plant proteins come in importantly too, because the animal fats that we consumed 2.6 million years ago weren't saturated in the persistent organic pollutants that they now are. So so basically, the only way to bind persistent organic pollutants in animal fat is plant fiber. It's the mm. only way to bind it. And mm. 
if you absorb these persistent organic pollutants, some of them have a half-life of 30 years. And once you intermittent fast, you're releasing those into the bloodstream. And there have been many studies in animals that have shown that when you fast an animal and you release those persistent organic pollutants, there is significant damage to the brain that occurs, to the organs. And there's this basically hepatobiliary recycling. You just can't excrete these. Mm. So you got to be able to bind them in the intestinal tract during that hepatobiliary recycling of these persistent organic pollutants. So you consume some resistant starch. I mean, God forbid you consume a little resistant starch, right? I mean, <laughs> but I try to look at solving, the, solving my, my health through a 21st century lens. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting that uh, although we do you know, some people try to uh, live a healthy life, you can't really avoid all the environmental toxins and other uh, kind of inflammatory compounds that we all get exposed to even in our past. So those mm -hmm. things, they still have like some residue that are kind of left in, in our body. And uh, if you do release them, then the only thing that can help with that is to with, with the consumption of these plant fibers that you mentioned about. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> that is kind of, yeah, it kind of puts into the perspective that food quality is really important, uh, not only for like longevity, but also like your cognitive functioning and uh, everything else. So uh, what, 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 from the perspective of longevity, uh, what do you think about then the idea that, you know, protein consumption is, you know, associated with increased cancer and increased mortality? Yeah, I think it's more quality where your protein's coming from, more so than quantity. Um, and I think lack of cycling protein so you want mm. phases of where you're working out and basically breaking down your protein and intermittent fasting where you're not consuming a lot and then feasting. So mm. it's more so people aren't going through the cyclical protein intake that we used to do that our genes are matched to. So either, you know, um, just chronically eating a high amount of, you know, animal protein, um, not necessarily a good thing. You need to cycle that. Um, so in the quality and how you cook your meat, right? Grilling versus cooking in the crock pot. It does make a difference. You are creating advanced glycation end products and other heterocyclic amines when you grill meat. Um, there is a, there, there's, there's been benefits of consuming a low advanced glycation end product diet in clinical studies um, simply by not overcooking meat. They took participants um, and they put them on like a, like a, you know, more of a slower cooking type of, meat that they were consuming mm. and there was improvements in biomarkers blood pressure insulin sensitivity so all those things will add up um but and there's the nuance of pastured eggs which i think is super important compared to just your factory farmed egg and then also grass-fed meat versus you know grain finished mm. meat mm. yeah that's for sure is there like any limit or the amount of protein they uh, like a person would uh have to stick to or, or does it vary I think, you know, if you're doing a full body workout and you are a larger guy, you can benefit from consuming up to about 40 grams of protein um, and in just regards to muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. But if you're someone just working out your arms that day, um, 30 grams is probably enough. Um, and then when you get older, you become what's called basically anabolic resistant to the muscle protein stimulating effects of protein and you actually need more. Um, and elderly seem to benefit from whey protein in particular because it's high in sul sulfuric proteins, basically high in cysteine, which helps form glutathione. And so elderly seem to benefit from actually eating a little bit more protein, maybe like 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Uh, it's, it is true that you know, in, the, in the longevity blue zones, and uh, the people there, they do have like a much more cleaner diet and uh, high, high quality nutrients. And uh, they're also like, they, they do different types of uh, activities throughout the day. What, what kind of similarities or um, some unique characteristics that you found from those blue zones that you talked about in your book? Can you like uh, go through those? Yeah. So basically, like you said, low processed food, it's all natural food. They're using you know, healthy salt added to the food. It's not, all, it's not processed salt added into packaged foods. Mm -hmm. um, they are doing more of like a, um, 
not necessarily like a rigorous lift heavy lifting like we do. We don't have as much time as some of these people in the blue zones where they can just walk all day and do light, moderate exercise for prolonged periods of time. So we have to figure out a way in, the, in a half hour to an hour or maybe twice a week to gain those benefits quicker. But yeah, it's definitely more social bonding, um, definitely more Merino omega-3 intake compared to what we, we consume, and a lot more antioxidants. I mean, mm. literally. That, and a lot of, I mean, going through it, people, you know, I really with the book, The Longevity Solution, I wanted to understand what is aging? Like literally, what is it? And basically what aging is, is it comes down to damage to the DNA of your cell. Mm-hmm. And once the DNA is damaged, the cell can either die or it can become a senescent cell, which is even worse. So these senescent cells basically secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines. And that's what aging is. It's an accumulation of senescent cells, accumulation of damage. And you can reverse that. There are things called senolytics, which can actually lyse and break up senescent cells. Um, one of the strongest being fisetin, which is in strawberries. In order to actually get the therapeutic dose, most people are not even consuming close enough. You need 14 ounces of strawberries a day to get a therapeutic dose, basically a fisetin to basically break down those senescent cells. Mm-hmm. The other uh, molecule that is a senolytic is EGCG and green tea. Mm-hmm. So this is why, you know, in the longevity solution, we were, you know, promoting green tea, um, promoting red wine has some of these things. Red wine also has quercetin and actually has resveratrol and a very bioavailable form of resveratrol through red wine as well. And you're getting, you know, the benefits of the grape skins and seeds with the red wine. Mm -hmm. Um, So things like that. Um, But really, how do you prevent DNA damage? That's number one. Okay, so, so one of the best ways to do that is hormesis. You strengthen your cells. So exercise, you induce heat shock proteins through sauna or hot baths. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of like strengthening yourself. That's one of the best mm-hmm. ways to promote longevity is hormesis. Um, everyone used to think it was like consume a ton of antioxidants, and that's mm-hmm. part of it, but not for the antioxidant benefit. Most antioxidants actually work by upregulating your own endogenous antioxidant mm. systems. They actually damage you. Most, and most foods high in antioxidants cause a little bit of inflammation, causing your own body to upregulate its antioxidant enzyme systems. Um, so things that you can do to prevent the damage, again, hormesis, so the exercise, um, light sun exposure, eating plants because they're slightly pro-inflammatory, but then lead to, again, that increase in hormesis. Mm-hmm. Um, protein cycling, intermittent fasting. And then it comes down to what can you put in the cell to prevent the damage? So one of the best things would be astaxanthin. Um, Astaxanthin can span the lipid bilayer, it can protect the outside and the inside of the cell. And it can also protect the, the, um, the fatty acid tails from oxidizing. So, you know, pr- protecting all your cell membranes by saturating your cell membranes in astaxanthin from krill oil or, you know, seafood is an important strategy to prevent the DNA damage occurring in the first place. And then we talked about, well, once it's occurred and you've had these senescent cells, how do you get rid of them? Well, you can consume 14 ounces of strawberries a day. You can take maybe a fisetin supplement. I mean, I can't give recommendations. This is just general info. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's about 65 milligrams of fisetin that's been shown to activate, you know, the senolytic therapeutic benefits. And then consuming, it's not just green tea, unless you're consuming 10 to 12 cups of green tea, you're not going to be able to get enough um, EGCG. So you either have to have a catechin enhanced green tea beverage, or 800 milligrams or less a day of green tea, like extract supplementation Mm -hmm. is another way to activate autophagy and and senolytic Mm -hmm. benefits. Mm, Yeah, I I do. It's it's quite phenomenal that uh, these uh, polyphenols and these uh, these uh, antioxidant compounds they work in a way by causing some mild stress to the body, and then the body kind of gets stronger by upregulating all its antioxidant defense systems and other pathways. So uh, yeah. it's 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 uh, it's like it, you 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 can't say that it's it's harmful, but uh, the kind of end result is gonna result in a, like a more positive uh, result <laughs> but but what, what, what do you say about some people saying that um, it's not worth it to kind of stimulate these pathways with the help of 
plants because you can stimulate the same pathways with things like exercise and cold and heat and fasting and so on. So why yeah. would you want to go out of your way to go <laughs> eat the plants? Right. No. So what I would tell people is number one, those things don't bind the persistent organic pollutants. It's just something that you have to get generally through plants, at least in a natural way. You can consume things maybe like activated charcoal. They're, they're not really clinically tested that well. You can maybe try to do some pectins and other, other binders. I don't know how well they work. Um, but again, so that's you know, maybe you can get something like that. Number two would be the resistant starch. Um, you know, consuming resistant starch is extremely important. If people can, you actually are a fat burner. Your bacteria in your colon are burning resistant starch and producing short chain fatty acids. So you are the ultimate fat burner when you are a fiber fermenter. Mm. So, if, so a lot of people want to be like this fat burner and I'm not consuming yeah. carbohydrates, but really if we're more bacteria than human cells and you want to be a fat burner, you want to be a fiber fermenter then because mm. that's what produces the short chain fatty acids like butyric acid and that's what activates GLP-1 when you do that. And GLP-1 basically has this broad spectrum benefit on the brain, the heart, insulin sensitivity, things like that. Every single longevity population consumes a very high resistant starch diet. And every paleo study that you will ever look at, at a minimum, we generally consumed 40 grams of fiber um, or resistant starch, but even upwards of 150 grams. Mm -hmm. So there's real benefit there, I believe. If you are someone who can't tolerate plants, fine, I get it. But I truthfully believe those two benefits are very important. The other benefit is unless you're consuming raw meat, which has its risks, when you cook plant or animal food, you create a B6 antagonist. So even though you think those foods are high in B6, when you cook them, you create a B6 antagonist. So the only way to get B6 in a bioavailable way is to consume things like green bananas, consuming raw plants. I'm not going to consume raw animal foods simply because I don't want to risk, you know, consuming raw mm -hmm. eggs or things like that. So there's a, there's a third benefit of consuming plants that you can't just get through intermittent fasting or drinking, you know, some beverage. Um, you know, some people can tolerate, you know, plant drinks like green tea and coffee, and they don't consider that consuming plants. So those, that's three, but there's, there's many other benefits too. One being alkalinity. I've looked at the clinical studies. If you look at any randomized study giving either sodium bicarbonate, potassium bicarbonate, or just simply giving people more fruits and vegetables, they, their kidney function improves, their bone health improves within about a few months. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that in populations, you can, you can see those benefits quickly if you test someone with moderate kidney disease or you test the elderly. If you test me and you, you're not going to see benefits in just a few months. And so no study has ever been done for a decade giving people more plants to improve the alkalinity of the body. So a lot of people will argue and say, well, blood pH is kept constant, alkalinity is a bunch of garbage, and that's not true. If you actually look at the studies, the citric acid in the urine will um, go up when you consume plants. The pH of the urine, if you're consuming a high animal protein, low plant diet, the pH will go down. Your urine is more acidic. Your interstitial fluid is more acidic. You cannot pee out those animal proteins that are high in sulfur and that are more acidic. You can't just or you can't just breathe them out. Excuse me. Some people think you can just breathe out that acid. These are non-volatile acids that you're consuming, and there is a net acid load. And sometimes the bones will be pulled of their alkaline minerals to maintain a normal blood pH. So I think in the long run, the 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 alkalinity benefits of either consuming a sodium bicarbonate beverage. You don't have to eat plants, but you could consume a mineral water that's high in bicarbonate. That's also important in fasting too, because within two to four days of fasting, you go into metabolic acidosis, which is why you see minerals continue to spill out in the urine in the fasting studies that go beyond a day or two is because you're in metabolic acidosis. So mm -hmm. part of the benefits of reversing that is you is consuming like bicarbonate during a fast. Like I, I always drink Gerald Steiner water because that not only provides the bicarbonate, but the magnesium, calcium, things like that.
Mm. Yeah, it's a good good trick to uh, make the body alkaline again without having to like eat a bunch of uh, vegetables or fruit, especially during like a longer fast or something. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, a part of it, w- why you become so acidic during a fast is also like uh, the ketone bodies. So uh, what's the role of ketone bodies in that scenario? And, uh, you know, is there like a kind of safe limit that people should kind of avoid? Yeah, you know, going through the studies, I do recall I was trying to dig into your exact point, like why does the body become so acidic? And ketone bodies were a part of it. Um, but I can't recall what the other part, it, there, that, that was about half of the reason why. And there's another half of the reason. I have to go back and look at the studies again. Um, to see what what the authors hypothesized why but yeah I mean part of the reason too in a fast why salt is so important people go on these water fasts and they never bring in the salt is because ketone bodies are negatively charged so they will pull a positively charged ion with them in the urine so you they'll pull sodium ions until you can basically adapt it takes about a week of adaptation but even if you go fasting longer for that period, 25% of people who fast will have these gigantic spikes of salt loss, even up to mm-hmm. a full teaspoon in the, in, throughout the day. Even though they're consuming absolutely no sodium, your kidneys never fully shut it off. So for the other three out of four people who are fasting, they're probably going to lose about 40 to 50 milligrams of sodium. They'll never be able to fully shut it off just in the urine that doesn't count you know sweating you'll probably lose depending on if you're exercising anywhere upwards of a full teaspoon of salt mm-hmm. mm, yeah that's that's quite interesting and even 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 more so to it's, it's even more important to kind of take your electrolytes and salts during a fast as, as, you, as you said yeah yep, mm. for sure yeah i want to return to the uh, resistance starch for a moment uh you mentioned that it's you know beneficial for the gut and uh, what, what kind of where can you find in which foods Yeah, so basically, you're looking for, once you cook a food, you've basically cooked out the resistant starch. So good resistant starch foods, my top one is undercooked potatoes. Um, So potatoes, most people don't view potatoes as a vegetable. They don't think it's healthy, but it's actually one of the highest sources of potassium. Um, And if you can get healthy organic potatoes, yellow, red, purple, they can provide good phytonutrients as well. They can provide good beta carotene for especially sweet potatoes. So if you undercook them, I don't necessarily eat for the pleasure of eating. I'm eating for also the health benefits. So I don't mind eating a somewhat hard potato. Um, it's almost like a soft apple is how hard you want that undercooked potato to be. So if I'm going to be cooking potatoes, most people will throw them in an oven for at 350 for a full hour and get that nice caramelized potato. Mm-hmm. where as generally I, I really only cook them for maybe 35 40 minutes and that's it mm-hmm. um, you can regain some of the resistant starch by cooling them for a full eight hours um, and when you cool them for eight hours and then reheat them you have basically still you, you can almost triple the resistant starch by cooling it um, actually you quadruple it excuse me so you go from like, let's say four grams of, of fiber to 12 um, or to 16, you quadruple it. And then when you heat, heat it, you lose about 25%. Now here's the key. If you do a blood glucose test, okay, on a cooked and cooled potato, the, the difference in glucose on a, like a blood glucose meter isn't going to be that different. It's the AUC of the glucose that's different. And it's the amount of starch that's hitting the gut and the GLP-1 that you're not measuring that increases. Mm -hmm. So we know that higher resistant starch foods don't necessarily have that much lower of a blood glucose spike. But if you look at there's clinical studies in people who have had their colons removed and have ileostomies and they've done comparisons, they've cooked and cooled the potato and you get four times the amount of resistant starch that hits the ileostomy so to speak that's basically would have hit the colon if these people had colons Mm -hmm. um so we know clinically that if you cook and cool a potato there is a difference in how much fiber is going to hit your gut and that will affect how much glp is released and short chain fatty acids and all these other benefits you're not going to necessarily see it on a blood glucose monitor reading Mm -hmm. 
But over a long period of time, if you, if you tested people eating cooked and cooled potatoes versus people who eat cooked potatoes, I guarantee you, you would see insulin sensitivity going down in the people that are consuming the cooked potatoes versus the cooked and cooled potatoes. Mm. You need longer term studies. You got to look at many more biomarkers mm. than just looking at a blood glucometer. Mm, yeah, for sure. So the, it does like, uh, have like some sort of an anti-inflammatory effect as well. What's that? What does? Anti-inflammatory yeah. effect. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Resistant starch absolutely has an anti-inflammatory effect. Remember, you're absorbing a ton of minerals through your colon too. So um, these, you're changing the acidity too. You're, I, I be, if I recall correctly, when you're increasing these short-chain fatty acids, the studies show you absorb minerals better as well from the change in the pH of the colon. Mm. So there is an important aspect too. a lot of people demonize plant foods because they're less bioavailable, but then they make your colon healthier and they change the pH of the colon. So you absorb minerals better lower down the intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So how much you're actually getting in the body is more than what people think because of that aspect. Mm, yeah, I do. Uh, like every once in a while, when I do have like some sort of a carb meal, then uh, the potatoes I do like, I, I like to keep them uh, at least like slightly uh, less cooked and uh, tougher so that they would maintain some of the resistance such. And uh, yeah. the co cooking and cooling technique is also pretty uh, convenient, so to say. Yeah, absolutely. And you can tell too, like, you know, the, the, the easiest way to tell is you literally just have some more gas when you cook <laughs> and cool a potato versus when you're just eating potatoes mm. um, that aren't cooled. Mm. And, and you will notice that if you eat potato salad, you're a little more gassy versus you know, a, a cooked potato. But other foods that are high in resistant starch that are common foods in longevity populations are beans and whole grains. The problem is, is the whole grains promoted in the United States are terrible for you. They're mm. not real true whole grains. So there's a huge nuance and you know, I'm, I'm working on a book kind of to talk about this and to really go into the, the details of this. But current whole grains are ran through a steel roller mill. And when you run a whole grain through a steel roller mill, it's so fast and there's so much friction, it strips the bran off the whole grain. And so now you're losing the resistant starch and you're exposing basically the healthy fats to more of the oxygen and becomes rancid and a lot of mm whole grains, just throw the three parts back together and call it a whole grain. That's not a whole grain. It has to be intact. And the definition of a whole grain was produced to help agriculture by saying, as long as it contains the three parts, even though they're not intact, you can call that a whole grain. And the problem is, is it's not regulated. So a lot of these agricultural guys aren't even keeping the germ, which has all the vitamin E and the healthy fats, they're throwing it out because it makes their bread go bad quickly. So they're just throwing two parts in and claiming it's a whole grain. But if you look at a lot of healthy populations, they consume a lot of traditional whole grains. So if you look at the Sardinians in Italy, they consume a lot of traditional sourdough bread mm. and a lot of other, you know, more rye breads and, and things not using you know, a, a yeast, but using a true sourdough type of, you know, way of fermenting and getting the healthy bacteria. And it's totally different than what we think is a whole grain in the United States. Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, that's like a really important point. And I'm glad you brought it up that, yeah, there's a difference between regular, you know, white bread and uh, this sort of a healthy, quote unquote, uh, whole wheat bread that's sold in supermarkets and like traditional sourdough, sourdough bread. And uh, the, all of them have like a different effect on the body. And yeah, <laughs> it's quite unfortunate that, um, you know, although s some people may react negatively to all types of gluten, but there's still like a different, uh, like a difference in quality between breads and between cereals and everything else. Yeah, I mean, there's clinical studies showing that you know, it's not necessarily the gluten. Um, when you start stripping the vitamin E and all these other benefits from whole grains, and then you're just giving isolated gluten, that can be a problem. Um, and what's interesting about whole grains, why they're so uniquely, in my opinion, beneficial, is they contain a ton of ferulic acid, which is one of the most potent antioxidants. This is where coffee is getting most of its benefit. Even though coffee doesn't contain ferulic acid, it contains chlorogenic acid, and your bacteria convert chlorogenic acid to caffeic, and then your body converts caffeic to ferulic. And so ferulic levels 
after you consume a cup of coffee are higher than caffeic or chlorogenic acid. So you're getting most of your benefits through plant consumption through ferulic acid. It's mm -hmm. an amazing antioxidant. It's been shown to prevent like ischemic reperfusion injury in animal studies. And the bran um, of whole grains is very high in a bioavailable form of ferulic acid. And the other key benefit is something called um, IP6 or phytate. Everybody thinks phytate is horrible because it can bind minerals, but phytate isn't a big issue if you have a good diet. If, you have a, mm -hmm. if you're only eating cereals, then yeah, it's a problem. But if you're eating a, a very healthy, high mineral diet, you're going, most people are probably going to benefit from this phytic acid in whole grains, and here's why. So the storage form of phosphate and inositol in whole grains is called IP6 or phytate. Um, and basically, this molecule has been shown in cancer patients. They'll give IP6 plus inositol to improve clinical outcomes in cancer patients. Um, and so this molecule can even bind free iron in the blood. So mm -hmm. it can bind other free copper and other basically transition metals. So if you give phytic, phytate or if you give whole food fiber in animal studies, it regresses cancer. It reduces the amount of tumors. Um, so I think there is a huge benefit to consuming this quote unquote demonized like mineral binder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and, that's, and that's another form of like a mild hormetic uh, stressor as well. But how, how would you, uh, how do you personally consume like uh, these grains. grains? Yeah. Yeah. What I normally do is I'll probably have like two slices of Ezekiel bread with pastured eggs. So I'll, cons I'll use the Ezekiel bread to bind any type of persistent organic pollutants in the yolk. And I'll get some phytic acid from that. Um, so Ezekiel bread is basically, um, it's kept in the refrigerator. That's almost how you know a whole grain is truly whole grain is, is if you don't keep it in the refrigerator, it'll go bad within one or two days. So if you're getting a bread that doesn't go bad quickly, that's not a true whole grain. Um, so really the refrigeration section for whole grains is a great place to start um, because they're keeping it in the refrigerator because it's a true whole grain. So I'll do something like that, um, or a traditional sourdough bread I'll eat every now and then, um, or I will consume true, like 100% um, like whole wheat. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't consume like the whole wheat bread that's ran through a steel roller mill. Like mm -hmm. anything that I can get that's not ran through a steel roll, like steel roller mill, is what I'll try to consume for whole grains. I'll even consume things too, like quinoa and some other type of um you know pseudo grains right right uh do you do you pay, pay any t attention to like insulin or something uh, like that when you do eat like th those, those food that you mentioned there are slightly like higher in carb uh, are you worried about insulin or blood sugar fluctuations no because see the thing people worry about insulin but then you're consuming these things with fats and with proteins so it's not going to really spike your glucose or your insulin so yeah if you test just potatoes you may get an increase in glucose, but I don't eat just potatoes. Uh, you know what I mean? I will eat potatoes with some meat, with some fat. So when you combine, you know, those food groups, you're not going to really see the increase in the spikes. And again, it's really not, I mean, it, it's not really the spikes. It's the damage that you cause. If it's not an inflammatory food, you can have cyclical increases in insulin and glucose. It's not that big of a deal. It's if it's chronically elevated where that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, do you do any type of uh, intermittent fasting uh, as well? Yeah, yep. I, nor I normally never eat breakfast. Um, so usually I'm fasting for at least 16 hours. But I generally don't really fast more than 18 um, just because I, I, I generally tend to work out, do full body workouts twice a week. And so I don't feel like I need to do 24 hour fasts. I think some people, if you can get away with that, great. That's awesome. I just, my body tells me I need to eat at around 18 hours. I just feel better when I consume two meals because it's hard for me to get in all the nutrients I want in one meal on a consistent basis. Um, but if you can tailor that meal and you can really make it high quality, you might be able to do that. You might be able to basically eat one meal a day and get away with that. Mm, yeah, for sure. That's it's kind of the, 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 the definitely there are the many ways of going about it, and uh, some people, you know, choose to do it differently. Uh, but uh, we we we've talked about these uh, polyphenols and uh, plant compounds. Uh, I don't want to play like. Uh, 
I don't want to play the devil's advocate, but uh, essentially, like you can potentially like get some of those same uh, short chain fatty acids from animal fats as well. So uh, why would what would be like some uh, the rationale to be still getting them from uh, fiber? Yeah. So I think what you're saying is is like butter has butyric acid in it. Right. But right. consuming the butyric acid and then it being hit by the the acid in the stomach does it even make it to the colon? And is it is it in the same levels as what would be produced by your bacteria? I would say it's very doubtful that you can consume like these short chain fatty acids from animal fats and get the same benefit as feeding your gut bacteria to produce those naturally. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen a study that has shown that consuming like you know exogenous short chain fatty acids produces the benefits that you'll see when you look at clinical studies testing resistant starch. Right. Yeah, I would say yeah, it's it's better, like a you wouldn't want to place your bets uh, or your all of your bets on this one one way of eating just in hopes of that it's gonna work. <laughs> it's much more yeah. like much more sustainable and much more wiser strategy to kind of spread it out a little bit and uh, make sure that you cover all of your kind of bases. Like when you become more restrictive, no matter if you're vegan, which I don't believe is necessarily the best way to health. I think you can do it if you really know what you're doing. Like it took me forever to find a plant food that actually contains active B12, um, that plant food being chlorella. Um, mm -hmm. And there's been clinical studies showing that if you consume chlorella, it actually improves B12 status. But very, I don't think a lot of vegans really are consuming all the foods to hit the, you know, the vitamin D that's mm -hmm. missing, the B12, the carnitine. The more restrictive you get, the worse you probably are going to be. Um, so that goes from the one spectrum of carnivore being very restrictive and, and muscle meat carnivore being even more restrictive, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the other spectrum of being vegan. Um, and I think our book landed right in the middle for a mm -hmm. good reason. Half, half plants, half animal foods is what my plate looks like. And I think we did a pretty good job of saying, here's why half your food intake on the plate should come from plants and half should come from animals right. because of X, Y, and Z. And we go, we have tables in the book of yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah. You do kind of cover it uh, really well. Uh, and I, I think that you can be restrictive, uh, but it's, it should be done in like a more of like a cyclical manner and do it short term so that you yep. can experience the fluctuations and cause some like beneficial adaptations in the body. So Yes, in, it's like a long-term restrictive. Maybe like the isn't gonna be the optimal for longevity. But if you do it like short-term, and you cycle it, then it can have like a hormetic effect as well as like maintaining more of the metabolic flexibility. So it's yeah. it's almost like going back into the ancestral way of eating, where hunter-gatherers would go through different seasons and uh, different food groups as well. Yeah, exactly. So like to package it all up, like what what do we do for longevity? Cycle your food intake. Um, consume antioxidants because now we're being hit with a lot more damage. The ozone layer is not what it was before. So sun rays are great, but they are also more damaging than they used to be. Mm -hmm. The animal fats are also more damage, damaging than they used to be. So maybe you need a little more plant. So half, half plant, half animal foods when you're actually eating. Um, cycle those foods. Cycle protein intake, high protein intake when you, you know, after a workout. Um, lower protein intakes on days you're not working out or days you're fasting. Um, maybe a little red wine or green tea or coffee, one of those type of polyphenol beverages with red meat to help bind some of the iron. Mm. Um, potentially some way to bind those the free iron from the red meat, cook your foods better, um, and avoid the processed junk. That kind of wraps it all up in a, in a decent yeah. package. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how, how can uh, people maintain like a healthier intake of fats or how, 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 what kind of uh, fats should they try to get? Yeah. So good question. Um, you know, you're, it, it's, again, it's hard because, you know, marine omega threes are so healthy, but then you have to deal with the contamination aspect too. Mm. Um, so, you know, it used to be great maybe a hundred years ago to consume wild salmon every single day, but now you have to be aware that, you know, there's some contamination. So to be honest, I, I don't even at this point consume a whole lot of wild seafood. I used to, but honestly, now I just take krill oil and, and a very high quality, high dose fish oil um, because they test for the persistent organic pollutants, the ones that I use. 
Um, and so I'm not going to be getting the mercury either. Mm -hmm. And I'm still going to be getting the benefits of the high doses of omega threes, but also with krill, I'm getting the choline and I'm getting, um, the astaxanthin as well. Uh, so that's kind of what I think people are missing too, is they're missing the, the very first form of life on earth and the very first food that every single life form evolved on. And that would be blue green algae. And I consume spirulina every single day. Mm -hmm. And I've done an entire PubMed review on spirulina and all the clinical studies are incredible on it. Mm -hmm. I consume about six grams twice a day. And this, this, this spirulina or blue green algae was formed 3.8 billion years ago. It's literally these blue green algae are what gave us the oxygen, gave us life. It was the bottom of the food chain of everything. So all life formed off of consuming this food. And that tells you something that there's extremely amazing benefits. And I've published clinical studies on this topic and on spirulina. And basically it's another hormetic activator in a way it increases and it's like a bilirubin mimetic. Um, and it's been shown to improve insulin sensitivity. So I think, I think consuming these types of foods like chlorella and spirulina, no one's doing it. And I think there's a tremendous benefit that could be had from doing that, not just from the chlorophyll, but also from these things contain like zeaxanthin and other carotenoids that are healthy, um, GLA, healthy fats, um, and a healthy omega-6 fat. Does it, um, does it have any potential for pollution as well? Um, so yes and no. Um, it depends on how it's grown. Um, so that's a good, you want to definitely get, a manufacturer that tests for heavy metals, um, which is something that I make sure I do. Um, I get a company that does test for that. Uh, so that is important, but actually chlorella is one of the best things that can bind heavy metals, pesticides and insecticides. So I rarely consume a meal without taking chlorella and I rarely consume a meal without taking um, spirulina. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really pretty, pretty damn good. <laughs> I, I, myself, yeah. I, I myself enjoy like, these uh, you know tablets <laughs> that you can chew upon uh, that are yep. like also really uh, convenient uh, for traveling and if you are like thinking or you're expecting to be exposed to some something then yeah it can be used as like a precaution uh, thing as well yep uh, but uh, what kind of other supplements are you taking you know you mentioned that you're taking yeah. like your uh, like a high quality omega-3 uh, but what, what else yeah i take about 13 supplements <laughs> <laughs> um so L-histidine, um, I take two grams of histidine twice a day. Uh, we published a research paper on that. And so histidine has been shown at that dose, two grams twice a day in just 12 weeks to cause a six pound fat loss. So histidine is this healthy amino acid that gets converted to histamine in the brain, um, which has been shown to improve leptin sensitivity, um, reduce hunger, um, improve fat loss. So I take that two grams twice a day. I take taurine, um, one and a half grams twice a day. You're getting all my secrets today. I've never told anyone really like what I supplement with. Um, spirulina, six grams twice a day. Chlorella, three grams twice a day. I do the krill oil, um, about four grams of krill oil. Um, the krill oil I get, if when I take four grams, I'm getting eight milligrams of astaxanthin with it because they mm. enhance it with organic astaxanthin. Um, I take high dose fish oil, a very high quality fish oil. I get about three, I generally take about three grams every day. And then I will do these superfoods. I, I put in my collagen shake. Um, I will do a little bit of maca um, and I will put in some camu camu for the vitamin C um, and, and maca is high in copper and manganese. So they're like some of these bone building, collagen building minerals I put in my collagen. Um, I will do a very high quality like um, pastured whey protein um, just after I work out. That's really the only times I'll use it. Um, what else? Pycnogenol, 100 milligrams a day is what I'm taking. I will do grape seed extract, 300 milligrams a day. Um, vitamin K2, mm -hmm. so I will do both forms, K4 or MK4 and MK7. And then also I take K1 with it. So it's all, it's a combined like vitamin K1, vitamin K2 supplement. Um, I do D through vitamin D3. Uh, and there's probably a few that I'm missing here. Um, glycine I will take as well. Mm -hmm. About four grams of that twice a day to help build collagen. 
um, creatine, five grams once a day for cognitive benefits, but also obviously for the athletic performance. N acetylcysteine, anywhere from 600 to 1800 milligrams a day to help build the boost glutathione levels. Um, what else? That's almost it. You almost mm. got all of them. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks for sharing. It's a really yeah. awesome, awesome list. Uh, but uh, what do you think about these longevity supplements like metformin or something like that? Oh, yeah. I'm actually, I mean, I, if I was like insulin resistant, I would 100% take berberine, 500 milligrams three times a day without question. I mean, mm -hmm. this is what they use in, you know, Asian cultures that have been tested in clinical studies that have been shown to improve mortality in heart failure patients and, um, you know, have other benefits as well on insulin sensitivity. It's like your natural metformin probably with less side effects, um, may even activate more pathways. Um, so that's a very good clinically tested um, supplement. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Basically a prescription in other countries in a way. Yeah, I, I do think that if you are already healthy, then you don't need to take like a really these uh, pharma pharmaceutical drugs. You can get away with it by simply taking some natural uh, berberine powder and it's going to have like a, almost as, as good of an effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for uh, coming to the podcast and uh, we're going to start wrapping it up. Uh, where can people learn more about you and the Longevity Solution book? Yeah, so they can go to uh, drjamesdenick.com. That's my website. Um, you know, the Longevity Solution, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, so they can, you know, pick up the mm -hmm. copy, either going into a store or just ordering it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. well, how has been the initial launch been? Uh, how has people reacted? Yeah, I mean, it's it. How we package the book is a little more scientifically dense at the the first half, and then more so like quick strategies, and then five simple steps to longevity. So we we wanted to bring the science in and tell the story and have good storytelling, but also have good evidence, and then package it up in an easy way to say, okay, what are the five things I need to do to live longer? And so mm. I think people kind of like that and the visual, like the graphics, the images, um, victory belt did a really nice job on the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, decent, it's a good looking book <laughs> and uh, the graphics are uh, pretty, pretty uh, detailed. Yep. Uh, but yeah, people can definitely check it out in the, ch in the show notes as well. So, uh, James, thanks, thanks for coming to the podcast. And uh, when is your next book coming out? <laughs> yeah, I don't have a release date. Um, I'm working on a few, so we'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep you posted. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thanks. Uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or a habit you wish you adopted sooner that improved your body and your mind? Um. I would probably say I've always, I've always exercised, um, probably honestly the spirulina chlorella data and research and taking it before I consume food, mm -hmm. I think is what per personally is going to give me the greatest chances of living longer just from the research I've looked at. Okay. That's, that's, that's quite a bold statement. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it is, but I'm actually doing the research on the substance. Mm -hmm. I've published several clinical papers and I've done an entire review and I've looked at all the studies and simply from an evolutionary aspect as well. Um, I'm pretty confident that it, that it will contribute to mm -hmm. my longevity. Yeah. I think it's somewhat underrated or it's like miss it's overlooked. Like a lot of people don't really consume it and it does. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really even like it's not expensive. It's very cheap and, uh, it's uh, nutritious at the same time. Exactly. It, it's literally, I think, it is the most nutritious substance on earth. Like gram for gram, nothing's going to give you more vitamins and minerals than, than spirulina. Hmm. Well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's a good good note to end the podcast. Uh, keep, yeah. them, keep them wanting for more. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, yeah, thanks for coming to the podcast and uh, looking forward to your future work. Thanks so much. All right, that's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Hormone podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can now order my new book, Metabolic Autophagy, that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here. It's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To 
support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.